Today we're going to be talking about sequencing and the number one ingredient that you need to have in any sequence. And I know that some of you guys are yoga teachers here, and I also know that some of you may not be yoga teachers, or some of you are looking to become yoga teachers because you want to teach yoga, or because you want to um, just kind of further your own practice. And the way that we practice, or the way that we teach, whatever we're going to do, the, the, the practice itself has the potential to shift a universe. <laughs> when I have my yoga teacher trainings, this is um, very close to one of the things that I say on the very first day when they come. I say, have you ever had a practice or have you ever had a class that completely reshaped the way that you look at life, the way that you go through life, maybe that practice or that class that you took gave you insights into your life purpose, or that maybe instead of going this way, you really should be going this way. And after that class, you made a great monumental change. You made a great monumental shift. And I've had students come from all over the world um, and visit me in New York City when I had my studio there and had um, visited me when I was in, when I am in Costa Rica. And I've had students from Denmark. I think we have actually a student here from Denmark. And we also have had students from all the way down in New Zealand come. And it always makes me wonder, what is that thing that propels a person to to take that direction, to go from New Zealand, to go from Denmark, to go from um, all corners of the globe and come and do that teacher training, something sparked inside of them. And one of the words that we use in yoga to describe that spark is like a kundalini awakening, something awakened. And I know that that word kundalini sometimes gets overused a lot. People think, it's this like thing that makes you either go crazy or go into great bliss. But the most profound kundalini awakenings are those that are the most subtlest and but yet have the greatest impact in kind of reshaping you or remolding you as an individual, as a person um, and your personality and starts to make you to treat life differently. Um, as I'm talking, give me a thumbs up if you understand or hear what I'm saying. <laughs> you can relate to that, where you've had that like great awakening. And, <laughs> yes. and you understand what I'm saying, so it's not necessarily smoke and mirrors. One of my favorite yoga teachers, Eric Schiffman, always said like, his big thing was meditation and that the practice always leads to meditation. And he said that if we meditate just for one reason, it's so that we can go back out in life and make better decisions. And I really believe that the better our yoga practice is, the more concentrated it is. I'm going to come back to that in a moment, this concentration idea. The more concentrate, concentrated it is, the more potent the practice becomes, and then we go back out in life and we start making better decisions. And I think most of the people here are at a certain age, even if you're in your 20s, <laughs> you can go back into your life and go, gosh darn it, why didn't I make a better decision at that point? Because that decision that I made led me to where I am now, which is not where my heart is asking me to be, is not where my dharma should be. And so our decision process that we have in life really kind of predicts our future. And so using the words of my teacher Rod, which is um, something I'm gonna give to you guys in this template, is that Our yoga practice ultimately helps us create a better future. Our yoga practice ultimately changes the course of our future. So 
Having said that, um, I'm gonna dive right into the PDF. And All right, so as I mentioned earlier, hello, I'm Yogi Aaron. <laughs> and today we're going to learn the number one ingredient to create a life-transforming yoga sequence. Receive my Ayama Master Plan. This is the sequencing recipe that I developed or have been developing over 30 years of teaching. Um, you'll gain some practical tips to make your classes accessible for all levels. That was one of the questions that came up. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and then get a chance to ask me some questions. So what is the number one ingredient to creating a life-transforming yoga sequence? It really boils down to intention. What is your intention? What is the intention of your practice? What is the purpose of your practice? What is it that you want to cultivate? What is it that you want to uh, take away? Using an intention. So when you're doing a practice, I cannot tell you how many times I hear yoga teachers like, oh, I want to teach my students to be grounded, but I also want them to feel more you know, expansive and feel connected with the universe. And, and they give like, about 10 different intentions. And a lot of us are like that too when we practice. We constantly are having a lot of different reasons why we're practicing. You know, we have all of these different thoughts in our head. And one of the, if you take one thing away from this today, as you're a teacher or as you, if you're a practitioner, the most important thing in a yoga practice, and the most important thing to cultivate when you're doing a spiritual practice is your ability to concentrate on one thing. Your ability to hold one idea for an extended period of time. That's meditation, ultimately. That's one of the big steps in meditation. Pratihara, dharna, and then dhyana. You have to have the senses go inward, focus on one thing, and be able to hold that one idea for a long period of time. I know some of you in life feel like you're kind of flailing around sometimes, and you're moving this way, and you're moving that way, and you kind of see something bright and shiny over here, and you start chasing after it, and then you see something bright and shiny over here. <laughs> And the thing is, like, so many of us are like that in our yoga practice. Oh, I want to go study bhakti yoga, but no, I really want to learn more about asana. Oh, no, but I really need to start learning meditation. Stick with one idea. And that is also really important, especially when you're leading a yoga class. What is one idea that you want to experience? What is one thing that you really want to experience. In my life, and in the past teaching a lot of classes, and I've taught thousands of classes, that for a long time there was one theme, there was one intention that I was teaching. Actually, I stuck with that intention. I weaved it in every single yoga class for a good part of a year to two years. And that was an intention, um, that was the definition by Krishnamacharya of a yogi which is one whose spine is full of light. And I just started teaching that. That was the basis, that was my intention, and that I held that intention because I wanted the students to become fully steeped in that bhavana, steeped in that idea, steeped in that feeling of what does it mean to have your spine full of light. And so many people are trying to weave this and weave that, and, just stick with one idea. The more concentrated your intention is, the more potent it starts to become. One of my favorite kind of analogies these days on this idea of concentration is, I hate to say this publicly, but I'm going to anyways, is that I'm a huge Disney fan. <laughs> Actually, I just celebrated my 50th birthday at Disney World, and I'm not ashamed of it. Um, but... When I was at 
One, one of my favorite Disney movies recently, well, not recently, but in the past few years, is this movie called Maleficent uh, by Angel, um, Angelina Jolie. And, you know, there's a scene in it when she's doing this spell, you know, over the cauldron. And I often compare the yoga class to like a cauldron. You know, you put mantras in, you put asanas in, you put mudras in, you put bhavanas and visualizations and bhakti. You put all of these different ingredients into your cauldron, into the cauldron. Your students are sitting in this cauldron and you teaching your class is like you starting to churn the cauldron with your uh, broomstick. <laughs> And the more concentrated it is, the more potent and stronger the cauldron becomes. And the reason why I was drawing on that Disney analogy is because Disney in, in their, you know, magic works, you can see the spell starting to come out of the cauldron and starting to go out into the world and have this effect on the world. And that is what we're doing in our yoga practice. What we're ultimately doing is generating this spell, generating this concentrated intention to begin transforming not just ourselves, but it goes back out into the world and has this very powerful effect. So that is a little bit about um, intention. And you want to be able to weave it throughout the class. You want to allow it to be a point of focus for students to use to help them build concentration and take their practice deeper. There's a lot, there's so much stuff <laughs> being taught in the yoga world today. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you, if you, like I said earlier, if you take one thing away from today, teach not just yourself, but your students how to concentrate on one thing, on one thing. If you can start to get their mind focused on one thing, oh my God, it changes the course of their life. It's that concentrated effort that begins to allow for space for, allow the space for grace to descend. One of my favorite quotes from my teacher, Swami Rama said, the ascending force is effort and the descending force is grace. And that grace descends upon us. Teaching people how to concentrate, and it's fair to say that most people today have very little ability to hold one idea in their head for very long. If you don't believe me, get on some metro and look around and watch how many people are just scrolling through their devices. <laughs> they can't stay focused. I think, I think that they say something about tweets. People like read a tweet like in half a second and then they're on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a judgment or it's just more of an observation on our society's ability to hold one idea. And if we as yoga teachers can impart that gift, if you will, on our students to be able to hold one idea, do you think that might have an effect in the world? <laughs> Maybe, just saying. Uh, for those of you who might be interested. So allow it to be a point of focus for students to use to help them build concentration. And this is how we start to go deeper into our practice. One of the biggest words that we hear constantly is, oh, um, you know, go deeper into your practice. Well, if you really want to go deeper into your practice, the way to do that is through concentration and intention. So the intention really sets the foundation for everything. And again, if you are a practitioner here wanting to learn, stick with an idea, stick with one intention. One of the things that my teacher Swami Rama uh, used to say, and, and if you go and read anything about him, one of the observations that he continuously made throughout his time uh, in the West 
was how often people go chasing gurus. They go chasing practices. They go chasing um, this teacher because they think this teacher has got it. And maybe they stick with that teacher, that practice for a month or two, but then they found like, oh, the next best thing. And one of the comments that he made that really kind of stuck in my head, which is why I don't chase after teachers, is this actually creates more confusion in the mind it actually starts to create more confusion and the mind becomes more disturbed. And so the idea then becomes that we actually are able to hold again that one thought, that one practice, that one idea and, um, and stick with it. And then there, there's this sense of like ripening. There's this ripening. My teacher Rod used to say that students are like, fruit. You know, don't pick them from the tree until they're ripe. Don't give them the next practice until they're ripened a little bit. And we tend to go on to another practice way before, even before we've even flowered, let alone turned into a fruit on the vine. <laughs> that, that, that we tend to jump too quickly into another thing. Whenever I've done practices in my life, I feel like one of the reasons why I have knowledge of some practices, not all the practices, but many practices, a small portion of practices, I don't want to put myself too high up because I'm not. <laughs> but one of, the, one of my sources of strength or power has always come from my dedication to sticking to one practice. I remember when I first discovered um, <laughs> I heard a comedian use this term the other day, manscovered. A manscovered is when everybody else knows about it, but you've discovered it for the first time, and therefore it's a new discovery, so I manscovered. <laughs> um, uh, restorative yoga. And it came at a really kind of pivotal point in my life when I started practicing it, and I made the decision to do it for a long time. And I pretty much stuck to that practice almost daily for the better part of a year. And by doing it, I got to really experience the power of restorative yoga. And that's just one, one small example um, of really sticking with something and then discovering the true potency of a practice and what can be revealed from it. These practices are like flowers, you know, when they first bud, sometimes they smell a little bit, but then the more that they bud, the more that they sit there, they give more of a fragrance. And that's what our practice is like. So here is the Ayama master plan for uh, sequencing any kind of yoga practice, whether it's for yourself. And Ayama, by the way, stands for Applied Yoga Anatomy and Muscle Activation. So the Ayama master plan empowers the students to end class stable in mind, or sorry, in body, mind, and spirit. So these are, these are the key points that you want to have. Now, one of the questions that came up, which I'll just quickly mention, is how do you teach a class to all levels of people? This is the formula. This is one of the formulas is that you begin, you begin following something that is attainable to everybody. And I'm gonna circle back to that in a little bit, but this is really the way to start being able to teach multi-level classes. We start off by centering, chanting Om, take a few minutes or a couple of minutes or a couple of moments, sorry, to watch the breath. Number two, we warm up. And these warm-ups involve some dynamic movement with the breath using the Ayama techniques, the Applied Yoga Anatomy and Muscle Activation techniques to prepare the body, which ensures students are connected to their core strength. This is really one of the key ideas is not just to connect the student to their core strength, but also that the body becomes stable at a core level. Make sure all the muscles are awake and properly activated. We use postures like coming onto all fours, downward dog, 
Shalabhasana, dynamic bridge, arm raises, and plank, po plank pose. And are there other poses? Absolutely. These are things that we learn more about in applied yoga anatomy and muscle activation. Um, we Number three, you'll see that there's an asterisk there, vinyasa flows. They're optimal, optional and not necessary. Big many times people ask me like, well, how many sun salutations do you teach Yogi Aaron? <laughs> Here's a little secret. I do not teach vinyasa flows really anymore. I don't teach sun salutations unless it's a very devotional class. The whole idea of sun salutation has been used as sort of this gymnastic, if you will, kind of workout warm up. Very few people really embody the whole devotional part of that practice and instead use it as a quote unquote warm up. But what I really want to kind of point out to you guys here is that the real warm ups are in number two. And we do the warm ups that if we're going to do vinyasa flows, that we're actually using these warm ups to prepare for our sun salutations or dunde kriyas. Uh, number four, uh, standing postures, which can involve the warriors, the triangles, standing, balancing, standing twists, um, transition to the floor poses. Again, there's an asterisk there. It's optional and not necessary, but if we are, we're gonna do some arm balances, maybe some standing balances, agnisara, postures at the wall. Uh, number six, inversions. Again, optional and not necessary, but shoulder stand with a block, instant Maui or Vipariti Karani. You're probably wondering why um, shoulder stand and headstand and maybe plow are not there. They're not postures that I teach because they compromise the integrity of the body in too many people. Um, and we can talk more about that in the FAQ if you like. Uh, number seven are backbends, cobra, locust, bridge, bow, wheel, fish. Always try to put some backbends into your practice. You obviously don't want to necessarily do wheel or bow, po, um, bow pose every practice, but you want to put it in as, put the other ones in here as much as possible, especially locust pose. Um, the twists. Again, optional, not necessary, the line uh, twist and seated twist, using a print, uh, yama principles and not passively stretching. Uh, number uh, nine, forward bends, line and seated postures, again, using the yama principles, no passive stretching, please. And then number 10, the final muscle activation postures, which really kind of centers around hip extension or hip flexion engagement. Number 11 is Shavasana. Uh, you want as much time in Shavasana as possible. One of my teachers um, who is really, I, I call her the queen bee of restorative yoga. Her name is Judith Lassiter. I think she actually was one of the originators of restorative yoga. And she's very adamant about 20 five minute shavasanas. She doesn't believe that a yoga class is a yoga class unless it has a 25 minute shavasana. That's one thing that you get to experience with me in Costa Rica uh, when you come is 25 minute shavasanas. And towards the end of training, everybody can't believe that 25 minutes goes by as quickly as it does. <laughs> And then number 12 is pranayama. Um, we always love one-to-one -one breathing and nadi shodhana, and then of course, meditation. So here's some sequencing tips. Um, number one is never stop learning. Include these basic uh, three ayama practices in every single class. Bridge pose, shalabhasana, and plank pose. That should say plank pose there. So make sure that you include all three of those. And you'll see that earlier uh, in the notes here, we actually had that in the warm ups here. And we made it part of it Shalabhasana, bridge pose, and plank pose. Very important postures. Um, very important ayama print, uh, based postures that help to engage 
some of the key muscles in the body. What those muscles are, that's another uh, webinar. Don't feel like you have to give everything away at once. This comes back to this idea of concentration. Again, when you're doing your practice, whether it is, you know, you're teaching it or whether you're doing it on your own, don't try and get everything at once. Stick with something simple. Give people a really simple idea if you're teaching a class, even if it's just one-to-one -one breathing. One-to-one -one breathing is a powerful intention. If you can weave one-to-one -one breathing throughout your class and have people come back to that, inhale, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four. If you can weave that into an hour, an hour and 15 minute, an hour, uh, an hour and a half class, oh my God, the level of transformation that you will start to engender is off the charts. So don't feel like you have to teach everybody everything at once. Not everything has to be a transition. One of the questions that came up is how to do better transitions. I don't know that I have the answer for that, but I think that people get too caught up in how to get from one posture to another. If you really want to understand how to get from one posture to another, just tell people, okay, you're in downward dog, come up to standing. <laughs> Why does it have to be a big deal? Why does it have to be this really cute transition? You're not teaching a fitness class, you're teaching yoga. Always remember that. Um, number, next one, always teach to the stiff biffs of the yoga class. What, again, one of the questions that's come up a lot is how do you teach to all levels, Yogi Aaron? I teach to everybody, and I always, if, if I have stiff biff come in, if I have someone come in with a shoulder injury, if I have someone come in with a knee injury, um, if I have someone that just came in with hip replacement, I teach to that person and everybody else follows. And not that I'm necessarily calling out that person. Please don't think that I'm calling out that person and all my attention is on that person. But all of a sudden, now I know if this person has, you know, in, problems with the integrity of their knees or problems with the integrity of their shoulders or other parts of the skeletal system, I know that other people have the same issues or other people in the class will have the same issues. So I'm really interested always in creating stability. Stability, stability, stability. So I always look for whatever injuries are going on and I always teach my class to those injuries. I always teach at a level that is available to everybody. Uh, there is no such thing as an advanced yoga class. Advanced yoga is sitting still. And I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about this for a second. When I was in my 20s and I thought that I knew everything about everything in the whole world that there was to know, <laughs> I, I, um, I was really deep into an Ashtanga yoga practice at that time. And so... <laughs> I remember it was in that transition period. I was, I was studying Ashtanga yoga. I was living in Haiti actually at the time, which was a really unique moment in my life. And I decided that I wanted to transition and move to New York. So this was actually before I moved to New York. And I was based in Vancouver for about three, four months. And so I went to Vancouver and staying with a friend who gave me this pass to this gym. And and so when I went to the gym, I discovered yoga classes. Yay! And guess which yoga class Yogi Aaron went for? The advanced yoga class. <laughs> because I was advanced. I was an Ashtanga yogi. So anyway, I went to this yoga class and I was like, okay, we're going to kick ass. I'm going to learn some really cool moves. Remember, I was in my early, my mid-20s at the time. And we got into class and the teacher said, okay, everybody, come and sit. We're going to start with the meditation. And at this point, I had never meditated. I believed I was a person that could never meditate. 
I could never sit still. I was one of those kinds of people that could barely hold one thought in my head for more than a minute or so. So all of a sudden, I'm sitting there in this advanced yoga class meditating. Um, finally, after about 20 minutes, she decided that she was gonna start teaching some advanced yoga. <laughs> <laughs> and so we started going into this class. I can tell you right now, there was nothing sophisticated about that yoga class. But to really kind of bring it home, we had to sit about another 15, 20 minutes at the end of yoga class, meditating again. <laughs> Many years later, I was talking to my teacher, Rod, telling him about this story. And I said, you know what, Rod? I don't think it was until this moment that I realized it really was an advanced yoga class. So, advanced yoga. <laughs> what is advanced yoga? Advanced yoga is sitting still. Advanced yoga is holding certain postures for a long period of time. You want to get your students feeling a sense of tapas? Get them to hold Marichyanasana pose or Arda, Arda Matsyandrasana pose or Paschimottanasana. Get them to hold that for five minutes. Get them to hold it for 10 minutes. Then they're going to start to feel something moving and shifting in their consciousness. So that's my take on advanced yoga. I don't really buy into the whole thing of advanced yoga being your ability to stand on your hands or your ability to um, I guess, wrap your foot around your head. To me, that's not really advanced yoga. Um, so based on the definition from a yama perspective, we're really looking to cultivate stillness. Remember Sutra 246 says very clearly that the definition of an asana is coming and being still while experiencing tremendous joy. That's Sutra 246, baby. That's what, we, what it says about asana. And then the last point here is on this page is to stop and allow the students to feel and go inwards. And this is for two reasons. The number one reason is pratihara here. Pratihara is this idea of sensory withdrawal. It's this ability to bring the senses inwards. And I used to teach my yoga class. I used to have a studio right on the corner of 23rd Street and 6th Avenue in New York City. I think some of you had actually been there before. Um, <laughs> and this, but one of the most fascinating things was, you know, I used to teach this class at 6.30 in the, in the uh, evenings. And that was just during rush hour. I mean, of course, rush hour in New York City starts at like 3.34. But at 6.30, it's just utter mayhem. And it's just constant barrage of like honking and screaming and you know whatnot. It always fascinated me because we brought that into the practice. I just learned to bring it and make it part of our practice. But what happened was is that all of a sudden, it was like somebody turned the volume down in New York City. And I'm sure that most of you have had that experience where you're doing a practice you can hear things going on in the background, but then all of a sudden, it's like somebody turned the volume down on life. That is pratihara. And that's what we're wanting to get our students to experience because at that moment of pratihara, they're completely within themselves. They've completely drawn in. And one of my teachers used to refer to that as drawing into the inner kingdom of heaven being able to go into that inner sanctuary. The idea of Purusha is that we're able to rest within that city that is always at rest, always still. The other idea with this um, coming and just pausing for a moment is really to allow the students to also feel the intention. So again, this is one of the places that you really start to allow them to feel that intention. So that in those pauses throughout the, your yoga class, for example, if we're talking about one-to-one -one breathing being the intention, that you're creating that pause for your students to come back to the breath, to come back to following, inhaling, two, three, four, exhaling, two, three, four. 
So right here in your PDF, you can click on this link here and it will take you to one of my Ayama masterclasses, which I'm really um, so excited about that to be able to share that class with you. It is a perfectly balanced and sequenced uh, yoga class. And as when you go there, please be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can get more classes. I'm actually going to be releasing a class, another class tomorrow or the next day. So stay tuned for that. And um, if you're going to be signing off soon, I just want to say thanks right now for joining. <laughs> but I also want to be able to open it up for some FAQ at this time. So please feel free to jump in and ask some questions if you want. Hey, Mary Erin. This is Mary. Hi, Mary. Um, okay, so a question. I thought I heard you say tonight that you don't teach the sun salutations. No. Nope. Yet they're in the master class. They are in the master class. That's a good question, Mary. Um, they're in the master class, and I, we put them in there because um, so many teachers that come to teacher training or people that want to learn from me want one class that they can go and teach other people. And so, <laughs> the, you know, sometimes I call the sun salutation smoke and mirrors, that you have to give people what they want and slide in what they need. And so the, the sun salutations are in there because a lot of people, again, are wanting one class from me that they can kind of copycat, if you will, or mimic, which is completely fine, and that they can start to give to other people that is a perfectly well-balanced sequence class. And so the sun salutations are just in there just so that people can um, be able to mimic it and give, like walk into a gym class where people believe that they need to have sun salutation in order to feel a yoga class. You don't have to do the sun salutations. You can easily just take them out. And um, Mary, since you were with me in my last teacher training, if you take them out, what would you add to the class to make it an equal length class? Longer Shavasana? Yes, you pass, Mary. <laughs> longer Shavasana, longer meditation, more pranayama, and maybe just taking more time to focus on a posture, you know? Um, and so as you get good at, you know, as you get good at remembering that master class and breaking it down and understanding why we put things where we put them, you can start to add in more things as well. Okay. So you, you can kind of play with it, but that's why we put uh, the sun salutations in there. I'm really glad that you asked that question. Thanks, Mary. Um, Thank you. Jakob, you had a question, I think. Yeah, I do. <clears throat> um, now, first of all, you were talking about these three poses that you always include. Yes. Uh, in, in Lotus Pose, I picked up myself and I included in every class. But what, what you, and I remember your argument for that, talking about how you activate these muscles and that makes it easier to also get deeper into other poses in a healthy manner. But what's your argument for the other ones? Um, so Plank Pose starts to activate the core. One of the biggest muscle groups that is really important to activate is the transverse abdominus. And one of the trans, the role of the transverse abdominus is to stabilize the trunk and spine, to stabilize really the spine and keep the spine safe. And so you think, and the transverse abdominus has many different functions. The transverse abdominus stabilizes us as we side bend. The transverse abdominus stabilizes us as we fold forward. The transverse abdominus is also one of the key rotators. So if it's not functioning properly and you just turn, you all of a sudden are starting to recruit muscles that may not, probably shouldn't be used. Like if I turn around and I reach behind me and all of a sudden my transverse abdominus isn't working, what is starting to pick up the slack is these tiny little muscles in my shoulder. So I don't know if you've ever had that experience of turning around, picking something up, and then going, oh my God, I just tweaked my neck, or 
I hurt my shoulder or something like that. It's because the transverse abs aren't working properly. So you always want to engage the transverse abs. And there's so many yoga postures where the transverse abs are not activated properly and stabilizing the body. So that's, that's for plank pose. And then the other one is for bridge pose. And that's just really for the glutes. I usually actually will throw um, bridge, as you know, Jakob, in at the end of every yoga class. Almost before Shavasana, I always end, most of the time, not always, but most of the time end with bridge pose. And just because it is, again, so stabilizing, it activates the glutes, which if the glutes aren't working properly and the person gets up and stands up, they can easily throw out their back. Or if they're you know, getting up from the yoga class and you know, running to do something, the, the glutes are really the shock absorbers of the body, of the spine, of the lower back. And so it's really important to make sure that they're working properly to maintain a sense of stability, um, specifically in the hip structure and in pelvic structure. Okay, cool. But also, if I may continue, you are, you mentioned uh, uh, your dislike of the passive stretch. Yes. Uh, could you put another word for what you mean exactly by a passive stretch? So a passive stretch versus, um, so one of the terms out there you hear a lot is dynamic stretching versus passive stretching. So I just kind of, just going to kind of put a little plug at this moment since you opened the door to subscribing to the YouTube channel. And there's quite a lot of classes that I have on there. And you'll quickly start to see the difference between dynamic and passive stretching. But passive stretching is when you're like, for example, sitting in seated forward fold, Paschimottanasana, you're sitting down on the floor, your legs are stretched out in front of you. And you grab a strap and you put that strap around your feet. And then you start pulling yourself forward. Or some of you are a little bit more, have more range of motion. You can grab your toes or your feet or your shin bones and you start to pull yourself forward. That's a passive stretch. You're passively pulling yourself beyond your body's in range of motion. A more, a more kind of way of dynamic stretching is to actually bring the hands behind the back, lift the chest up, keep the hands, the, you know, lock the hand to the wrist and then start to just fold forwards and stay there. So that would be more of a dynamic stretch, if you will, because when I'm grabbing my feet and pulling myself forward, the work is now coming from my arms. But your ability to fold forward is not dependent on your arms pulling you forward. It's actually in the contraction of the abdominal muscles and related also to the ability of the leg muscles, the top of the leg muscles, the thigh muscles, to be able to shorten. So those are the muscles that are shortening. So when you're working more dynamically, another example, by the way, which is usually a way that I will um, personally practice, is by lying down on the floor, your legs straight out in front of you on the floor, like in Shavasana, and then you bring one leg up. That's dynamic, and it comes down, and the leg comes up, and the leg comes down. But the, if I bring the leg up, and again, take a strap to the foot, and I pull the leg closer, now I'm moving passively. Anytime we move passively, we start to bypass the connection between the brain and the muscle, and the muscle will start to shut down. The muscle weakens. And so that's why we want to avoid passive stretching. Okay. Um, can I ask a question more? Sure, go ahead. And then, and then we'll just see if anybody else has a question, yeah, and then we'll come okay. back to you if nobody does. But if you're moving back into what's actually the theme of the class, of this teaching, and we're start, starting to talk about keeping one point in, in your teaching and, and carrying that through your class and through many classes, mine lately has been for, for people to accept their feelings, to observe their feelings and accept them as they are, mm -hmm. and to be able to sit with whatever feelings pop, pop up. It's uh, a very powerful you know, intention. Become the witness of your feelings. I think it's the I think it's like the key to becoming more authentic as a person that you can 
actually manage to sit with your own feelings. And just like the one you were talking about, the filling the spine with light, they're beautiful intentions, but how do you actually land it into your class? How do you actually carry that through? How do you make that the focus? That's where it becomes a little more difficult to me. Well, I mean, with, with your intention, you know, sometimes some intentions, and, and we learn this in yoga teacher training, so this is not something I can really unpack here, because um, that's kind of like a very big question that, you know, can take definitely longer than a few minutes to unpack. But we start to begin to look at different postures. So if our, or if our intention is to feel that the spine is full of light, then I go, okay, well, what postures really start to activate energy in the spine? Well, definitely back bends, laterals, um, eh, forward bends a little bit, not really, but the big one is twists. Twists, so kind of using the category of twists. So then I'm gonna to start to center my class around more of a twisting theme and starting to bring that intention with that. So we need to look at the postures. What do the postures do? So what do back bends energetically do? What do uh, forward bends energetically do? What do uh, twists energetically do? What do laterals energetically do? And then again, this kind of category of postures, which is referred to in the Vini tradition as extensions, but really this idea of elongating the spine. And starting to take those, those different categories of postures, look at what do they energetically do and how are they going to energetically amplify this. So with you maybe doing like, you know, sitting with feelings, it just really depends. If you look at forward bends, which are very introspective, you know, that might be a really great way to bring into the class because it creates stillness. But in the same time, maybe you want, you know, feelings to explode of your students. And so maybe bringing more of a backbend focus, maybe bringing more of a restorative backbend focus. <laughs> my, my teacher, David, used to say, sometimes you can teach a class where you're like putting your, your students' fingers into an electric socket and just watch them explode. <laughs> so are we gonna say, Yakum? Do you actually name your intention with your class, with your students? Do you tell them, this is what I want? Or do you just try to let them experience it through the class and hope that they arrive at the place you would like them to arrive at? I always, usually, um, there's, there's one little exception to that, but I always talk about the intention. I always talk about it. There's actually one of the latest practices I just uploaded on my YouTube channel. It's um, about a 55 minute class. Even there I sit for just a brief second, a brief moment, and kind of talk a little bit about the intention. And um, so you always kind of bring it in and then kind of start to, like I said, flower it throughout the yoga class so that people can start to feel the potency of it. Thank you. You're welcome. Does anybody else have a question? Lots of people here that I know. Nice to see you all here. Hey, Jan. <laughs> Hi, Erin. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, so, hi, I just have a question um, around yoga nidra, and I experienced that with Michael a few weeks ago at Luosa. It was incredible. It was the first time I'd experienced that practice. Nice. And it was a half hour session after our hour of, of yoga. Um, so that ended up being an hour and a half, which was, again, like you said, it, didn't, it doesn't feel like an hour and a half of yoga. <laughs> and um, so um, I'm fairly new to um, a sustained practice over the last few months. Um, it's brought me through some really traumatic mm. um, periods of my life. And, um, but I just, uh, I'm just wondering, like yoga nidra is a practice in itself past Shavasana, although we were lying in Shavasana, 
Is that something that you would normally do in a class of about an hour? Would you take people through a half hour more dynamic class and then a half an hour of yoga nidra? Is that something you might do? I no. <laughs> okay. Um, so there's some actually very specific guidelines around yoga nidra, um, and. So I tend to like to practice yoga nidra as its own practice, um, mm -hmm. following some very specific guidelines. Now, I'm not saying mm -hmm. what you experienced was right or wrong. I'm just kind of going based upon what I've been instructed and how I've been instructed. But one mm -hmm. of the things that I wanted to just kind of say is that, that there's a lot of similarities between Shavasana and yoga nidra. Um, and but it's also fair to say that yoga nidra, sorry, that shavasana is a preparation for yoga nidra. And I'm just going to also put in one other little thing here. Um, put a little bee in your bonnet. So that so many um, people uh, will check out when they're relaxing, and I'm not. That's not a bad or good thing. It's just is and that that really what you're trying to work towards is maintaining I'm going to circle back to where I just started concentrated throughout the practice that there's a part of your mind that's concentrated that you're aware of what's going on so that's where shavasana really becomes the preparation for yoga nidra cuz yoga nidra is conscious sleep that you're bringing a sense of consciousness to all those different um, states of mind, if you will. And the way, the best way that I can equate this, there's two examples I'll give really quick. The first one is like, you know, like when you're in Shavasana and yoga class, you know that you've gone deep and sometimes you kind of go someplace, but then you can hear the person snoring next to you. Or like if you're at Blue Osa, sometimes the generator goes on and you're like so relaxed and you're so in that space, but there's like, oh yeah, the generator's going on, but I'm aware that I'm in Shavasana. That's the place that you wanna be. That yes. is the practice of Shavasana. And then the second example I can give, because it's one I can relate to a lot, is like you're, you have to wake up early in the morning to go to the airport. And you know you're you're you know don't that you sleep. you don't <laughs> actually sleep, but sometimes you do. Sometimes you're actually able to go into deep rest, but then you wake up, or or your mind, part of your mind wakes up. You may not wake up, but part of your mind goes, oh yeah, I have to wake up. And then sometimes you roll over and you look at the clock, and what does it say? It's five minutes before the alarm is supposed to go on, right? That's consciousness. There's the idea. What the yogis discovered, which I think is brilliant, because a lot of people aren't aware of this fact, that when you're sleeping, a part of your mind is always conscious. And it's not like that front level, but there's always a part of you that is always aware. Your mind is like a camera that when you go to sleep, what do you do? You close your eyes, you're putting the cover of the lens on top of the camera, that's all. But the camera can still take photos, right? The camera can still take pictures. It's a blank screen, but it's still taking pictures. By the way, that's one of the reasons why you should never fall asleep with the TV on, because <gasps> you're just absorbing all of it. So you, you definitely, when you're doing Shavasana, it is a preparation for Yoga Nidra. Thank you. You're welcome. By the way, in the online academy, we actually have a yoga nidra course with about four different yoga nidra practices. So just wanted to kind of put that out there. If you want to explore yoga nidra more, there's a whole situation on it in the um, online academy. So. <laughs> um, so two people raised their hands. Uh, we're going to circle back. Well, that was Jen and... Uh, Jakob, is your hand, did you just raise your hand? Nope. Okay. Oh, we're going to lower it. Yeah, I oh, did. It you did. Okay. <laughs> um, I was just curious about what you just said about um, 
checking out because and maybe you're talking about checking out in a different way from the way I understand it but I find that when people check out it's often people who are greatly traumatized who will do that also during a massage but also during uh, anything where they actually have to feel themselves and be present they might check out particularly if people with PTSD yeah are you are you talking about in Shavasana well, that was where the question mark came okay. in was, is that the same thing you're talking about? And is that what could happen in Shavasana as well? Or yeah, and, you know, I just want to backtrack just one second because I, I very, you know, I, I say that in a little bit of tongue-in-cheek because the, the truth is, is, you know, everybody checks out um, unless you're, you know, Swami Rama or something. So you, everybody's going to check out. So I didn't want to say that, like, as a badge of guilt, I said that more as, and it was trying to actually circle to a point of this idea of concentration that that's actually in that relaxed state is where you start to build the real power of relaxation. And, um, and so a lot of us just go into you know, Shavasana with this attitude of like, I'm going to check out. That's my intention, like me as a practitioner, like, oh yay, Shavasana, I'm going to check out. And what I'm saying to you guys is, if you do check out, fine, you know, don't worry about it, you know. But go into it with an attitude of like, I'm going to breathe consciously as long as I can and stay in that space as long as I can. So, um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it does. Yeah. Okay. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> Anybody else have a question here? We're coming up to uh, one hour, and I don't want to, you know, consume too much of everybody's time. Um, I think we have time. If you anybody has one more question, uh, Jenna, please. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. <laughs> That's okay, Jenna. I was trying to show my face too. <laughs> um, hi, I'm, I'm new to you. So uh, thank you so much for, for doing this. You're very welcome. Um, thank you. So I have some questions that I think are follow on to um, some of Jakob's earlier questions. Uh, one is, um, so with the use of straps, so I actually really appreciate um, your message of no passive stretching. And just in the short time that I've kind of found, you know, your work and your teaching, I've really thought a lot about that. And it, it, it's one of those like light bulb moments for me. Can I, can um, I so just put in a, can I just put in a pick a quick plug for the podcast yeah. series? So when we release the podcast, there's going to be eight episodes. We're releasing the first three at once. And in the third podcast, we address exactly what's going on when you passively stretch. So just kind of look out for that, and I bring in an expert that explains it so easily. And when you hear it, you're like, oh no, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> anyway, sorry I cut you off. Please ask your question. Oh, I, I look forward to that. It makes me more, more motivated to for sure find the podcast. Um, so uh, with the use of straps. Is there any any time when you think that the use of the strap is hopeful for or appropriate for the pose? Or like, nope, never. You know, since I've been teaching a yama in the last three years, really religiously, I always habitually tell my students sometimes um, to get straps, and then we never use them. And I've been starting to notice that more and more, like, I keep thinking like, oh, maybe there's a posture we're gonna use. I just never use them anymore because the strap immediately elicits a sense of like, oh, let's passively do this pose. Um, and I just, I'm staying away from that more and more. There might be a place where we might wanna use the strap to kind of like keep the legs together in some restorative poses just to kind of like hold the likes together if that's what you want to oh, yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. But sure. in terms of like using the strap for any kind of poses, no. I do use, so this is kind of a, this is something that I, like? I get more, definitely don't teach that pose anymore. No, 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 no. Um, if I'm going to teach that pose, I would just 
you know, bring the hand there, and that's it. I would, because if you start to do this or grab it, that becomes passive. This is active, but if I start to force the arm further back, then it becomes passive. So instead of, instead of trying to passively go deeper into a pose, what I would do is like, okay, well, what muscles are responsible for this range of motion? And then how do I get those muscles stronger? And when you do training with me, one of the things I love to do <laughs> is I'll get you to do like, you know, just a simple thing, like bring your arm up to the sky and just kind of notice how far you go. And then I'll do like these muscle activation poses to get all the muscles that are responsible to bring the arm up activated. And guess what? Your range of motion usually increases by two to three inches. But not only does your range of motion improve, here's the key, most important thing that you have stability in that range of motion. If you just kind of push, bring your arm up and with the other hand, push the arm further back, You've lost your stability. You have no stability. You don't have muscle strength. So when you start to improve or increase range of motion without um, muscle engagement, muscular engagement, then you're vulnerable to injury. You don't have stability and you become vulnerable to, to injury. Uh, going to your question though about like, you know, using straps, I just don't teach passive stretching anymore um, in, in any of my classes. But what I wanted to come back to was that holding postures is really important. And so, you know, not every posture, like, you know, maybe one or two postures in a class that you really hold for a long time. And, and let's define by a long time as like three, four, five to 10 minutes, okay? Maybe longer sometimes. So if you're gonna do Paschimottanasana, what I would do and how I would set it up <laughs> is probably with a chair. <laughs> you know, if I really wanted people just to kind of like stay in there. So I would have people bring their hands behind the back, come forward, bring the chair up to their chest and let the hands just rest on the chair. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sometimes if I was teaching more of an extension oriented class, I would have people come forward and then maybe bring their hands down to the floor beside their hips to just stay in the pose. That's really potent. If you can stay like that for five minutes doing one-to-one -one breathing, the world will change indefinitely uh, for you. So I, but coming forward and grabbing the ankles or grabbing the feet, I don't teach that anymore just because the moment we start to bring passive movement into a pose, muscles, all the muscles shut down that we've been trying to um, activate and build up. Thank you. You're very I, welcome. I, it was good, great, one great question. Other, which I think is a sh short question. You know, I respect the poses that you think are harm, generally harmful to many students. Um, I'm interested in, and I'm sure I could do my own research on this, but I've been interested for a little bit now on um, bridge pose. And that's when you said you would do in every class. And so that is still, that is safe pose for people even that have, for example, like osteopenia, osteo, well, osteoporosis, that's further down the, the line in the envelope. But um, that that is not, that pose does not um, raise the same levels of concern. And do you have two seconds to talk about just like why, you know, because intellectually that feels like something that, you know, could. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm not quite familiar with what all what you said, but what I wanted to say is this, um, that what you just said, even though I'm not familiar with exactly what they are, it sounds to me like there's going to be some uh, communication issues between the brain and the muscles, especially around the glutes, right? And so you really want to get the glutes activated, especially since there's already miscommunication. They probably already have weakened glutes because the brain isn't firing the glutes properly. So you need to get those glutes firing, okay? So that's the first point. You need to get those glutes working. They're the suspension system. And when you come up into bridge, even though we're focusing really on this glute engagement, um, if you will, and even hamstring engagement, which is usually, like, if I pulled in um, 95 people out of 100, 95 of them will have weak glutes. So 
it's really kind of like a pandemic, if you will. <laughs> um, so that's the first thing. But the second point I wanted to make is that even like if somebody was in pain, obviously I'm not going to ask them to come up all the way. Just go up as far as they can go. So there was a moment when I really threw my back out. I was actually going to Greece last summer. Um, and the weekend or a couple of days before I went to Greece, I had this kind of like weekend warrior attitude, like I'm going to lose 20 pounds in this next hour. I'm going to get like four weeks of workout. My body is going to be chiseled after one hour. Like, you know, like when you get into that mindset. And so I really threw my back out, <laughs> like in the worst way. So I spent like the first four days in Greece trying to put my body back together again. And so, yes, I definitely did bridge. It killed me, but I didn't go up all the way. I just lifted like an inch or two off the ground, and I really focused on squeezing the glutes as much as I could. And so maybe sometimes we need to adapt the postures to fit the person. If, if, if coming up in bridge is going to hurt the person, maybe get them just to lift up like two inches or one inch or something like that. But the most important thing in bridge is really to squeeze the glutes because the glutes are what are, are doing the movement of that hip extension, if you will. So just getting them to start squeezing the glutes, that is going to already start to improve that mind-muscle um, connection um, and start stimulating, in, in science they call it gamma motor neurons. The neurons that are responsible for that connection, that firing between the brain and the muscle. So I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys again. Um, we'll be setting up a date very soon. Um, it'll probably be about one month from now. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Have a super wonderful day, everybody. Namaste. Thank you so much for being here.